Okay, uh, very nice to see you here. Um, I'm an engineer at Microsoft. Uh, usually I stay in room and just coding. I, I haven't left my house probably in three years. That's why the long hair. <laughs> so it's really nice to talk to real people in a different continent today. Um, so I'm usually very quiet, but if I'm given a mic, I, I tend to speak forever. So do kick me off the stage if I speak too much. <laughs> Uh, but before I was kicked off, uh, I want to uh, talk about something that hopefully uh, is relevant and useful to, to this audience, which is the management plane in software defined vehicles. Uh, oh, this actually works. Uh, I want to. Uh, so first I want to clarify what I'm talking about, right? Uh, uh, which is the manager plane uh, I'm referring to. So I think the, 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 the concept of the manager plane, uh, control plane, data plane is rooted from the networking world. Uh, I know it because I, I look it up in, in chat GPT uh, <laughs> or Google or Bing. Um, so basically the manager plane is about the, uh, the management components that uh, uh, configures and uh, uh, configures the different parts of your network infrastructure uh, to make sure they are configured properly. Then the control plane comes in to make the routing decisions, right? They decide how the package are routed, where which one goes to which endpoint, etc. And data plane is where the data actually flows, right? That's where there are data packets flowing on uh, on the where. And in the cloud world, uh, the concepts are a little different. Uh, usually, when we talk about management plane, we talk about like. Uh, how you manage the cloud resources, how you manage the, the, the virtual machines, put them together uh, as a compute uh, uh, as a computing environment. And once you have the infrastructure, how you use the control plane, basically to orchestrate those resources into a platform on top of which you can deploy like a different payloads. And then uh, at the bottom is the data plane. That's where the actual compute and the storage happens, right? That's when, when we talk about either compute, either storage, those are the considered data plane operations. And then we uh, talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is kind of a combined uh, management plane and control plane together. So basically with the API server, you manage a bunch of compute resources into a cluster. Then on the cluster, you have a scheduler. You can schedule different payloads onto that uh, cluster. Uh, um, and then at the data plane, those are uh, like a runtime components, like container runtime and different proxies and the uh, kubeless runtime to handle the actual uh, business traffic. So today, uh, my talk is about the management plane. It's all about how you can. Uh, actually, I was looking at the the Frank's uh, slides about a car. In a car, you have like so many components. So it's all about how you can put all the correct software to the correct components in the like uh, uh, in one workflow. That's what I'm going, going to talk about. It's all about apply the proper configurations. It's not about how the data is flowing. It's not a communication protocol, uh, nothing like that, right? It's just about how you configure your car. And with that, I will come back to the first slide and talk about the, the, the SDV environment. I think it's fairly to, to say, right, that, uh, although we are talking about a single car, it's really a distributed uh, compute environment. Uh, I mean, you guys know much more than me, uh, so probably I shouldn't talk to this slide that much. I think those are apparent, right? Anything previously wrong on that slide? <laughs> Yeah. And also, actually, you need a lot of cars, right? It's not even a distributed environment. It's a scattered environment. Like uh, in a police car, right? You usually have a laptop connecting to the police database, and you have a radio system connecting to the police radio, and you may have like a navigation system, etc. They are not even connected, right? They're just plugged into the same power supply. So they are actually a scattered subsystem in the same physical space. And if you want to manage that car as one unit, how do you know you have the correct software that is applied and configured properly on all those subsystems? And that's what we are trying to uh, propose a solution with this management plane thing. And I will just skip forward. 
And this, like, I mean, um, I'm not from the car industry. <laughs> I'm from the, the cloud industry. And when we were, we were discussing, like Boris was just mentioning, right? As we think about how we uh, apply the cloud engineering practices to the cars, there's a very um, common debate, uh, at least inside Microsoft, I guess. I can say that, right? So is that whether we should use Kubernetes in cars. So here I want to do a survey. How many of you are using Kubernetes or are, are planning to use Kubernetes in your solutions? Please clarify. In in car, let's say in car, in car. One. I want to take a picture of this and send to some people. <laughs> Actually, I I tend to agree. I think we have to acknowledge that the, the STV is a very different environment from the cloud, and we can't just take for granted that. I mean, on the surface, if we don't think about the details, right? When you have Kubernetes cluster, you can organize your compute resources into a high available cluster, right? You have all the wonderful things like HA, failover, elasticity, right? But if you actually look at, look at a little bit closer, it highly depends on how you manage your Kubernetes cluster. For instance, if you have a single node, right? You don't really have that much uh, high availability uh, basically, if the single node fails, right, you have nowhere to fail over to, and you don't have a node for redundancy. And of course, if your container crashes, Kubernetes can restart for you. So that's basically all you get for the high availability is to restart the process. And we know how to do that, right? We, we can just do that, like uh, set up a daemon or whatever. We can restart that. And you don't have any elasticity, right? Basically, that's the, all the compute resources you provision in the car, and there's no resource balancing, right? If the application is too busy, it's burning the node, and then it's burning the node. There's no other thing you can you, you can uh, load balance the, the workload to. And even if you put in some effort to, to put in multi-node, a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of multi-node Kubernetes clusters, they only have one fault domain meaning all the nodes are under the same power supply, same network infrastructure, which means it's likely if one node fails or the critical infrastructure fails, like a power failure, right? All the nodes will go away, right? So you 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 get certain redundancy here, right? Let's say if one of the nodes has a hardware failure, yeah, that node fails, then you can still rely on the other node. But if you have some infrastructure level failures, like a power or network outage, then essentially the whole cluster is, is useless. To, to get the full benefit of Kubernetes, right, you have to have this like multi-node, multi-fault domain configuration, which is not easy to do. I mean, I, we don't need to go into the details. This, this is pretty hard to, to do it uh, properly. And also in the reality, right, for, let's say we, we can do this. We, we can set up a proper Kubernetes cluster. In reality, especially in cars, we have to face some challenges, right? Like the resource constraints. We, we can't like just throw like three servers in the car. Maybe some fancy car, we can do that, but that's, that's a cost, right? And also, one of the benefits of the uh, Kubernetes cluster is this workload elasticity or load balancing. You can uh, scale a workload as needed, and you can move the workload around just to balance the, the, the resource consumption of your cluster. But in a car, your workload is pretty much predictable. You know what's what's running on your car, right? It's not like you are running like some accounting application all of a sudden tomorrow your car. You pretty much know what's going there. So you, you're pretty much not leveraging a lot in this area. And also, a lot of uh, cases, there's a strong affinity of the compute and the resources. Right? You, you can't fill over from one ECU to another. Maybe there's physically attached to some devices. It just doesn't make sense to fill over to a different ECU. But the, the, on the other hand, the Kubernetes does have a, a great benefit, which is the DevOps support. Uh, it has a very nice community, a lot of tools, services, uh, a lot of especially younger people, I guess, uh, 
uh, has a lot of knowledge and adoption to this. So that's definitely a, a plus. Um, but you have to be aware that there's a complicity associated with it to, to uh, maintain a properly configured uh, Kubernetes cluster. So basically, uh, all this slide is saying uh, Kubernetes is great. I mean, I have nothing against Kubernetes. I mean, in the past three, four years, all my projects were on Kubernetes, but it has some limitations, especially in the car uh, environment. And there's also something else we may need it, right? Like the, the payloads is not necessarily containers, uh, not, not necessarily uh, OCI containers. It could be binaries, could be a, a image, right? You want to flash onto the device, or it can be just a ban uh, just, just some uh, uh, the different package format under different frameworks. And so, some of some of the uh, uh, environments that they don't have the TCP uh, IP network, like a bus based system, right? You're, you're relying on messaging to communicate with each other. Um, but that's the basic assumption of a Kubernetes cluster, right? You have the, this TCP IP network under the nose. And also uh, there's a, like a constraint devices, like a, the device is so small that you can't even run like a Kubernetes agent on it, right? And also if we look at bigger, how we can manage a group of cars, like if you're, you are running a trucking company, how you can manage your fleet and how you leverage the cloud services uh, in your car. Th these are not like answered by Kubernetes by itself, right? So with all that, uh, we are imagining a, a managed plane uh, solution. And before I talk about the solution, uh, I just want to say in this kind of ideal solution, uh, what it looks like. Right? The first thing uh, we want to call out is it should be technical, uh, technology neutral. It should be uh, neutral to different protocols, different OS systems, different format, etc because as soon as we got bias towards a specific technology, we are kind of excluding a part of the ecosystem. So as this management plane, it should be technology, uh, technology neutral and it should be adaptive. We cannot anticipate all the things we know today. There will be new standard, new uh, players in the ecosystem. Uh, the system has to be adaptive to, uh, to new changes and it has to be extensible, right? Um, I think that this is uh, quite apparent. We can't uh, imagine that we can build up all the necessary components, all the adapters for all the systems and hardware of, uh, on day one. It has to be extensible to include additional components. And the first one, uh, I mean, I, I'm a software architect. I tend to try to delay the technical decisions as much as possible. So this is why I put it there to say, Okay, Kubernetes is great. Probably it's useful in a lot of scenarios. So this managed plane should be working nicely with Kubernetes. So if you chose to use Kubernetes, it should run natively on Kubernetes. You can take advantage of all the DevOps uh, benefits you, you get from Kubernetes. But if you don't have Kubernetes, uh, it, it should be able to run on a standalone mode, just without any Kubernetes. And also uh, it should be able to, to be connected to uh, cloud. Let's say if you have some capabilities you, you, you want to leverage from cloud, you should be able to bring it in naturally. But if the cloud is dis disconnected, it should operate autonomously as well. And as Boris mentioned, right, the observability is really, really important. And that's why we, we put in as one of the item, we want the end-to-end -end obs observability, meaning as a request traverse among the components, we want to be able to trace the entire chain, right? We want to trace from the, the source that all the way to the destination with the proper correlations so that you can trace like through all the component layers. And secure and compliant, that's a must, right? We, we are talking about a really uh, reliable uh, consumer product. And the last but not least, we want to like really a uh, low uh, total cost of ownership. We want this thing to be simple, like that simple, as simple as possible. Actually, um, <laughs> this, this this comes the, the, the awkward part. 
um, I can't really talk about the project today. Um, but the, in the project we are working on, uh, <laughs> so basically you can run everything, everything in memory as a single process. And the binary size, I think currently is about 40 megabytes. So like a really tiny thing doesn't consume much CPU. It's very, very tiny uh, uh, thing. Um, and seeing of the project, right? Uh, I, I know it's kind of disappointing. Actually, we were planning to do, do a live demo before we came here, um, but um, then we decided probably it's not ready for the broader audience yet. But for, for each of you, right, if you have interest, we can work offline uh, under NDA probably for now, and we can we can give you the base and try, try it out. So basically you can get a feeling of what we are trying to do. Actually, listening to, to today's session, I already see a lot of opportunities like uh, the your protocol, right? Yeah, as you have a lot of your protocol uh, components in the car, you can actually describe all the uh, components as one application and you deploy it. And not only you can deploy this one application as a single unit, you can also imagine in the production line of this vehicle, right? You can actually define stages. Like as the car is getting assembled, the hardware is getting put together, and also the software is getting loaded like stage by stage. And what we built in is this staged uh, deployment. You can actually, as the car going through the, the production line, you can actually deploy the application and see the application grow with your car, which is pretty cool. And uh, how do we do that? I mean, to, to realize this, uh, it almost sounds impossible, right? This is like a too good to be true. Uh, but however, I think one benefit of uh, me especially is that I, I know nothing about cars. Right? <laughs> when I buy a new car, my decision process is to, to drive on the road and say, oh, that car is nice, I want that one. So I, I, I don't know much about cars. But then when I talk to the car expert in Microsoft, I just force them to teach me like in a simplistic way what it's trying to do, what this component is trying to do. And uh, as they tried to explain that for me, try to dumb it down for me, I see it like a repeating patterns, which give us a very high level abstraction language we can build this managed plane with. The first one is the microservices, right? And, and application, it doesn't matter how complicated it is, it's a bunch of components interconnected with each other. I think that's fair. So that's the model we are adopting. So basically we'll say, hey, application is nothing but a bunch of components, but we added one thing. So in the microservices architecture, all the services are supposed to be loosely coupled, so there's no dependencies uh, among them. But we do see, uh, like, a, especially in a lot of legacy uh, systems, there's a, like a very strong dependency. When you deploy the system, some system has to be deployed first and verified before you bring down another component. So this is why we actually extended on the model a little bit we say, hey, microservices is a collection of components, but we do allow you to have a graph of dependencies. So you can actually have a, a dependency graph in this. And when we deploy this, we will actually honor the dependency relationships in that graph so to make sure everything is uh, deployed in order. And the second abstraction is this state seeking. And this covers a very broad uh, area of actions when you manage and configure a car, right? It doesn't matter if you're deploying a container, applying a helm chart, copying a binary, flashing a, a device, or applying a YAML file, JSON file, in a INI file, XML file. Basically, you have some like desired state that you decide, right? And there's a current state on the car, and there's a difference. And we do this state seeking to say, hey, here's the new desired state, do whatever possible to bring the current state towards this desired state. And with this very high level abstraction, we can achieve all those things, right? We can do all kinds of updates, we can do the policy configuration, uh, all those things. It's, it's all just state seeking. And the way we design this is that we, we can do everything by doing nothing. So basically this control plane actually doesn't do anything. It doesn't flash your uh, your device. It doesn't deploy container. It doesn't do anything. 
instead it just say hey here's the state and here's the here's the desired state here's the current state and for this state difference provider a do your stuff to to bring the two state together and if this provider happens to be like a, a helm chart or a, or a binary uh, flasher it will do its thing right but yeah thank you but but the the manual plane itself doesn't do any of those operations so this is a very important the separation of the concerns. We view ourselves as a strictly orchestration layer. So we, we orchestrate the workflow. We, we decide what needs to be done and we delegate all the how to be done to the enablement layer. And we view all those like uh, updating mechanism, configuring man mechanism, etc. Those are all enabling layers. So by separating us away from those enabling layers, we uh, attend like uh, technology neutral. Basically, we do, don't do anything like uh, uh, in real life, right? We just say something needs to be happen and here's the reason. And based on the system configuration, we will discover the proper provider to say, hey, uh, this is the state change you need to uh, apply. And we are able to do this uh, because we realize uh, rely on the popular virtualization uh, techniques, right? Like a uh, uh, virtual network, uh, 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 virtualized uh, uh, application runtime, like uh, containers or web assemblies, uh, etc. And even on the infrastructure level, uh, we can use like uh, virtual machine, etc. So, so whatever technology we can leverage to create this cushion between us and the actual hardware, we will leverage those, those virtualization uh, techniques. And with these three, we can actually uh, create such a management plane that has all those uh, characteristics and we can apply to like a broad uh, range of the, the cars and ecosystems. Actually, this project uh, was not initially designed for SDV. But we realized that SDV is almost like the perfect application scenario for this kind of system. And this is why we're, we're here. We're trying to talk to you to see if this makes sense. And if you have a, a, a desire to like uh, collaborate with us to, to get some like uh, a realistic scenario going. And uh, one last thing I just want to uh, mention quickly, right? Uh, I think uh, a, a few of you have mentioned uh, uh, in earlier talks, uh, before we can do the, all those, right, uh, as we can describe the desired state, etc., we need some sort of a modeling language to describe the car. Let's say uh, what a car looks like, what kind of attributes it has. And there's an abundant technologies out there, right? We have like a, a, like a helm chart, we have Terraform, uh, there's a chef and puppet. I don't, I don't think they are popular these years, but but there are a lot of uh, application models, right? Like even like the open application model or CNAP, uh, those are all application models. But uh, those kind of systems, they share a common challenge, is the relationship between the flexibility and the complexity. When the when the flexibility goes up, the complexity of system goes up. This because Initially, let's say if a system uh, uh, targets at very specific scenarios, you can have very nice template. You can have this like one click deployment. Let's say all your application is a single web server. You can just use that template and uh, deploy it. No problem. But as the use, use scenarios grow, you have to like uh, break up those templates into smaller and smaller primitives. Like user want to assemble the uh, primitives in different ways then your system becomes much, much more complex. So this is kind of a, like an unsolvable uh, conflict. If your system wants to be more flexible, it has to be more complex. I think it kind of makes sense. And the complexity is this, right? this gap, right? As you offer more and more primitives, the knowledge gap of how to assemble them together becomes bigger, right? It's just like if you sell a toy, the, the, the kids can just take the toy and play with it. There's no complexity. But if you sell like a Lego pieces, 
the people, the, the, the user has to know, OK, how I can assemble those Lego pieces together to, into something that I want to use. And that's the knowledge cap that all these systems face, uh, that um, how can I uh, make the system flexible without introducing additional complexity? Uh, this will be a little funny. And I think we finally have an answer, which is chat GPT. I mean, <laughs> this, this, this is not joking. This is not joking. It's actually true. So basically, with the chat GPT, I, actually, if you are familiar with uh, intent-based networking, which has been going on for like a decade, it's the same concept, right? Basically, instead of uh, trying to configure the networking primitives, it allows users to describe their intention with the network. And then the system will generate the correct primitives and sum them together. We just expand this idea. We say we do intention-based deployment. So basically, you just describe your intention, and we will use the, the chat GPT, which is grounded to your own data, and to generate those primitives and sum them together. And furthermore, we can even reverse uh, engineer this uh, system, right? Let's say if you have an existing system, we can actually apply the model to explain what has happened, right? In a lot of complex systems, there are some components hanging there for some reason nobody really knows what's true. I mean, this is more true in, in cloud, probably in, in car is less the case, but in, in cloud environment, there is some, some, some routines or some services is hanging there, nobody dare to touch it. But, but actually, with something like ChatGPT, right, you can actually reason this deployment to see, hey, why is there? And then make, you can make a more informed decision. Yes, one minute. So this is what we are trying to, to build into this management plane uh, 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 offering. So th this talk turns out to be like a, a shameless uh, advertisement for this project, which I can't show today. Uh, so I, I really hope I, I got some interest in you and please do reach out to us uh, and we can work offline to see uh, if this uh, solution makes sense to, to you. Right? Thank you. <laughs> Any really quick questions? <laughs> no, I think we want to see the demo then. <laughs> Uh, I, I make no, a no, fire. No, no, no. I mean, next, <laughs> next community day. To the next community day. Three months. Yeah, three months. Yes. <laughs>